we have to get an agreement from all the nations of the world that have signed this treaty that, yes, it's okay to go ahead and, and dismantle the treaty. Given the way that international politics works, we'd all be dead by the time that happens. <laughs> So a lot of people say we should do something right now. I mean, that, that's the point. The point is there's a lot of people who argue, and that's what the testimony before this subcommittee was about. There are a couple of people in the House and the Senate who are really concerned about this, who think we should be preparing now with some program to do something about this. Uh, part of that is these searches for Earth-crossing asteroids. Another part is to start building technology to do something if we ever find one. At the moment, we don't have the technology to do any of this. At the moment, we have no way to give an asteroid a sideways push, and we have no way to blow it up. If we saw it coming, we'd just be helpless. The chances of this happening are minimal. So, what do you do? How, how much energy would we require just if you want to land a craft yeah. and have exert some energy to give it that nudge. Yeah. You didn't use the nuclear weapon to blow up. Yeah. How much energy would that require? I mean, we probably don't have anything to even... How big a, ro how big a rocket? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I... You could work it out. Uh, <laughs> I could work it out in ten minutes, but I, I, I haven't done that. The answer is a lot. <laughs> we probably don't have that kind of resources, right? Well... You don't ever want to tell an engineer that something is impossible. As a matter of fact, you do want to tell an engineer that something is impossible because that will make him do it. You say, if you say to some engineer, I don't think you could do that, that's the best way to make that happen. Uh, the point is it would be very hard and very expensive. So it's a hard issue to think about because the chances of this happening are really minimal, but if it does happen, it's really horrible. So I use the analogy, am I going to buy life insurance against this? Am I going to insure my garage against this? I mean, no, I'm not going to. But should the whole world? If you are a senator and you vote to not do this, you are condemning everyone in the world to a possible death. If it were to happen. But now here's the real killer. Here is the thing that really gets me. And just, I'm finished now, but let me leave you with something else. Suppose we did this, and we developed a technology to protect ourselves from these killer asteroids. We could also use that as a weapon, because we could go out to an asteroid that's going to miss the Earth and make it hit the Earth in Iran, mm. or North Korea, mm. or wherever you want. This is called the deflection dilemma. If we build a technology capable of protecting us, it's also a technology capable of attacking us. If we develop the technology to do this, what happens if the North Koreans steal the plans? Or hack into the code. Or hack into the code. <laughs> and mess up the code. So, yeah, that's one of these issues. I mean... Deciding to do this is deciding to build a weapon worse than a hydrogen bomb. So that's where we are. The current situation is people are looking for asteroids, but not developing plans to do anything about it if they find one. <coughs> it would be a multi, multi-billion dollar project to develop, to develop the technology to protect ourselves from these things. The chances of it ever being used are minimal. It could be used as a weapon. If I was a senator, what would I do? Well, I'm not a senator, so I don't have to answer that question. <laughs> anyway, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Something was coming this way, and we don't have anything. If you were a senator and you made a decision, you wouldn't be in office too much longer anyway, so it wouldn't matter, right? <laughs> Think positive. If, if something hit... I mean, life as we know it is pretty much done for, especially for an extinction event like 65 million years ago. I mean, human race would probably survive somewhere. Might. Might. Maybe. It would be very hard life. Oh, yeah. I mean, these things are... I volunteer. Explain a little bit. You would not be able to see it coming. 
-hmm. These things go so fast that by the time you saw it, it would have landed. Uh, when the top of this thing, these things are so big that when the bottom hits the ground, the top is still in space. Uh, by the time, you know, if you were looking in the sky, beautiful clear day, you see this little tiny dot, you have, I don't know, a 20 thousandth of a second before it hits. So nobody would see it coming. It's just, suddenly it's over. Uh, we've seen a couple of these near-Earth things go by recently, and we seem to always catch them as they go. We always see, see them as they pass us by, not as they approach. Uh, I, I've heard this in the media a couple of times. Uh, is this true, or is this... Uh, I don't know if it's true or not. If you didn't hear him, he said that apparently we see them after they passed us. I suppose, I don't know what to say about that, except okay. when they're closest is when they're easiest to find. Yes, yeah, right. okay. And things like that. Uh, well, that's not true. quite true. No. Okay. Uh, for instance, uh, the Continental SW3 uh -huh. is approaching us, but we know it's not going to hit us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there are lots and lots of near-Earth objects that we discover coming at us that we know are not going to hit us. Yeah. But I do are. know that there was one event that happened that people didn't see it coming and suddenly it zoomed past us. That's what I meant. Uh, that's, what, that's what I was talking about. There's a couple of those. But the worst scenario is, <coughs> as far as visually seeing it, <coughs> as far as visually seeing it, is when they're coming from the daylight or sun, from yeah. the sun side. And you have to look the towards the sun to but see them. Alternatively, there's, there's radar that's getting to be quite yes. powerful now. Yep. That said, uh, it doesn't require it to be night yes. or to see them. Radar astronomy is, of course, the way to do this mm -hmm. uh, in broad daylight, as you say. The technique here is you send out a pulse, pulse of radio signals and it bounces back. Mm -hmm. We have done this in a directed fashion. People have bounced radar signals off of planets and things like that. Uh, the problem here is, is the way that works is you have a very tightly focused beam pointed right at the planet. Here we don't know where these things are, so you need a beam pointing everywhere. And if the beam points everywhere, it's diffused. So you need a much more powerful radar, radar it searches, signal. Searches in a pattern. Yeah. So if you've just got a very, let's say, tight beam of radio signals and constantly scanning it across the sky looking for things that you don't know where they are, that's a much harder project than something where you do know where it is, like Mercury, and putting your radar beacon at it. So radar searches for these things are much harder than radar studies of planets that we've done so far. Yeah? How expensive would it be to develop that program compared to going from Mars? Much more expensive. I would guess, much more. Um, the picture from the recent Japanese probe, the one the asteroid, showed a picture of an asteroid that looked more like an orbiting rubble pile than anything else. So it seems like there's not one right answer what to do. In yes. some cases it's solid, in other cases it's not. It's a very true point. Uh, something like a comet, or as you said, that, what was the name of that asteroid? I don't remember. Yeah. The Japanese man. Yeah are just sort of rubble piles, and it might be very easy to blow them to shreds. Very easy. Something like those pictures I showed you are big solid chunks of rock. That'd be very hard to blow to shreds. So you're absolutely right. It's a valid point. There's no single right answer. There's a lot of right answers, and that's one of the arguments for studying <coughs> asteroids a lot more to find out you know, how many things are there like rocks and how many things are there like rubble piles. A rubble pile is a little bit frightening because you can't give a rubble pile a sideways push. It's like pushing on a pile of feathers. <laughs> uh, you can break it apart into lots of little pieces, but those pieces are heading right towards the Earth. Instead of having one huge crater, you'd have a lot of medium-sized craters. So there's a lot of problems. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> I vote for that. You're for that. With fries? With 